I thought before we d d dive into chapter 3 of Romans, it would be a good idea sort of to take a, a review where we are, take, set this letter in its context. I'm kind of a knit one, pearl two kind of teacher. I want to go back and see where we've been, where we are, and, and regroup a little bit. See who this letter was written to, why it was written. Just a little brief overview. But before we do all that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father God, as we take hold of your word today, we pray that you would take hold of our hearts and that whatever we do not know, you would teach us. What we do not have, you would give us. And what we are not, Lord, you would make us. And it is in your, in your precious Son's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, from the best evidence available, it, it appears that Paul wrote the, the letter of Romans toward the end of his third missionary journey in Corinth in 57 AD. And at the time, I mean, Paul, of course, did not found, he, he was not involved in the stab, establishing the Roman church, but he obviously, when we see, when we get toward the end of the letter, he knew people there personally. So he, is, he had a personal connection with the church, and not just, as an, I mean, not just as an apostle, obviously he had an apostolic interest in the church, but he also had a personal interest in many people that, that were there. Uh, and he's writing this letter. Why was he writing this letter? Well, although Romans does contain the, the most complete statement of Paul's theology, it does not appear that that was his purpose in writing the letter, to give a summary of his theology. For example, he doesn't deal with the doctrine of Christ in any complete way of the doctrine of who Christ is or the doctrine of the church or last things. Uh, so you'll have to go to other letters to find a more complete treatment of those issues. But if you look, and you're going to see this if you haven't seen it already as we work through Romans, that Paul is actually dealing, he, he obviously had some knowledge of what was going on in that church, and he's writing, it appears, writing to deal with particular issues that the Roman church was facing. And from, this, from those issues, from reading the letter, it appears that those issues concerned uh, both Jews and Gentiles. And these, a lot of these issues are Jew-Gentile issues, which suggests two things. One, that there were both Jewish and Gentile Christians in the Roman church, which would make sense because it's, uh, it, it is a capital of the Roman Empire, and that certain tensions also existed between the Jews and the Gentiles in that church. So what are some of these questions that Paul is dealing with in Romans? I'm, I think there are a number of them, and, but given our time constraints, I just want to look at the first question that we've already been dealing with over the last few weeks, and that is, can one be made right with God by obeying the law? And that's the, that's, we've already been dealing with that now for three weeks, and now we're going to continue dealing with that and wind that up uh, today. It's, that's the first section of Paul's letter that deals, it starts at one, chapter 1, verse 18, continues all the way through to chapter 3, verse 20. So we're about two-thirds of the way uh, through that right now. Now, at the time Paul wrote this letter, I mean, he wrote this letter, he wrote it to Rome. Rome was a city of about a million people, which in ancient, for an ancient city, that's pretty huge, about a million people. And it stretched from the Roman Empire, of course, Rome was the capital of the Roman Empire. It stretched from what is today northern Iraq all the way to, what, to the British Isles, included, including all of Spain, France, northern Af North Africa along the coast. As a, as a matter of fact, what we call today the Mediterranean Sea was really little more than a Roman lake. The name for the Mediterranean Sea in Latin is Mer, and, and at that time was uh, Mare Nostrum, which means our sea, because it literally was a Roman lake. And as for religion, the Romans had many gods. In fact, even the emperor himself was considered a god. And Nero was the emperor at this time. He was, a 20, he, was 21, he was 20 years old, having been emperor for three years. And this is the same Nero who, a few years after Paul writes this letter, would burn Christians alive, would have them sewn up in animal skins and throw them to the lions. This is the same. That persecution had not uh, really revved up yet. That happened after Rome burned. This is the same Nero who supposedly fiddled while Rome burned. I'm not sure if that's true. But uh, he certainly uh, ended a lot of Christian lives. Now, from a Christian perspective, the Romans were pagans. Obviously, if they believed in many gods. I'm, I look at it this way. They may have been God-full, but they were 
godless. And that's what they were. It wasn't so much as they were, uh, that Romans were immoral as it, were, as it was that they were amoral. You've heard the expression, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Well, in the Roman Empire, what happens in Rome happened everywhere else in the empire, which is why Paul, especially east of Rome, which is why Paul seems to have been so familiar with the excesses of Roman society. You see it here in the, in the letter to the Romans, but you see it, you see Paul addressing the, the, the licentiousness of the Romans in other letters that he has written. Well, with that as background, I want to turn to a, just a brief review of what we've covered so far. Paul first takes on the, uh, the Gentiles, the pagan Gentiles, sort of the worst of the worst. These are people who Paul has told us, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God. Choosing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. These are people who exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. These are people who, men and women who change, exchange natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. These are people who are filled with all manner of unrighteousness. These are people who, although they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve death or deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. Paul then moves on, so that's, that's the Gentiles. It's, not a, it's, a, it's a rogues gallery of unrighteousness is what it amounts to. But Paul doesn't, Paul's an equal opportunity offender. He doesn't just give it to the, to the Gentiles, he then turns to the, to the Jews. And it, I think verse 13 of, of chapter two of Romans really sums up all of chapter two, really. He says, it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who are righteous. I mean, the Jews were so proud of themselves. They had the law, they had been given the law, they thought that gave them special status. And I suspect, because Paul is addressing this in the context of a church, that even the Jews, Jewish Christians thought, we're like super Christians. You ever been to one of those, have you ever gone to a church for the first time, and the people who were there when the church was founded, think that there are two categories, at least, of people in the church, the ones that have been there since the beginning, and those that have just came. I remember when I first started practicing law, we, had a, we still had hard copy, we still had books, most of our stuff now is online. I came across a forum book in the library in which it was possible for you to sell your pew. You, you had title to your pew, and so if you wanted to, to sell your pew, if so you know, even now, we, we people, and I'm looking around the room here, don't take offense, most, <laughs> most of you, and I'm, I'm in there with you, I sit in the same place every week if I'm not preaching. So I don't know how that works, but imagine though if the Jews, the Jews how they were with the law, they thought, well, we're, we're, super, we're super Christians, we were super Jews and now we're super Christians. Paul says, it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law. And he says, look, talk about the equal opportunity offender, just think about this. Paul uses in chapter 2, he uses Gentiles who by nature do what the law requires because the law is written on their hearts to hold them up as a mirror to the Jews to say, look, they don't, even have the, they don't even have the law. They didn't have the written, they don't have the Ten Commandments, they don't have the Mosaic Law, and yet they at least from time to time will keep the law because it's written on their hearts. You, on the other hand, are hypocrites. You have the law, but you don't keep it, but you hold it as a standard for everyone else to follow. And then so he ends chapter 2 like this, having blasted the Jews as well as the Gentiles. He says, for no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Remember Jesus, Jesus would say, don't pray openly, don't pray out in the street, don't make a show of your, of your worship because you've had your reward where? You've had your reward now among men. Paul's what Paul's saying here. 
He said, the Jews who, who practice external, external religion, even as Christians, or apparent Christians, would be uh, having the reward now and not later. So, that is, uh, that's sort of an a overview. Now we come to chapter 3. Y'all were thinking, well, I was never going to get there, right? <laughs> okay. So chapter 3 really breaks down into three parts. Verses 1 through 20, verses 21 through 26, and then verses 27 through 31. Let's take the long section first. Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. By no means. Or then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. What then, are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin, as it is written. None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their, in their paths are ruined and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, we know that what, whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. I want to take a look at the two questions Paul asked here. He asked a question in the beginning of, verse, of chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, and then he asked another question in verse 9. Let's take a look at that first question. And both of them are addressing the Jews, at least in part. He says, then what advantage has the Jew, or what is the value of circumcision? And then he answers his question, much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. Again, what's the context? He's just spent a whole chapter saying that how, un how unhypocritical and unrighteous the Jews can be to hold up the law as a standard and then not follow it. That the law can't save you, can't save these people. But then he comes and he says, then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with what? The oracles of God. And then he goes, and then look at verse 9, and look at the question he, he puts there. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. So on one hand, the Jews have an advantage, and on the other hand, they're no better off. Now you know the Bible doesn't contradict itself, right? But So the way I look at it is, both things are true, but we have to see how the, how the, the apparent conflict can be reconciled. So we have to reconcile two truths here. First of all, what is it that Paul says give the Jews an advantage? They were given what? They were given the oracles of God. What are the oracles of God? That's the old, what we call the Old Testament, the law and the prophets. So what was the purpose, and what was the purpose of these oracles? They were, the purpose was to give God's people to point to uh, the need for and the way to what? The Messiah. The one who would come to take away the sins of the world. Who would reconcile the creation to the creator. That's the purpose of the Old Testament. That's the purpose of the oracles. And who did, he, and who did uh, God give these to? He gave them to the Jews. So there is, there is an advantage in that. But that's not, so it was great honor, but it's not sufficient. 
Remember in chapter 4 of the Gospel of John, where Jesus is at the well with the Samaritan woman? And she says, should we worship here or we should worship in Jerusalem? And Jesus told her many things among them. He said, we, meaning the Jews, we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. That's what Paul is getting at here in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 3. It was a great honor to be given the oracles of God. It is, Jesus says salvation is from the Jews. You know, the Jews are known, and they're rightly known as what? The chosen people. Paul says, but you're getting it. I know you're the chosen people, but you have to understand, you are special because you are chosen. You are not chosen because you are special. And so that's, that's, that's number one. Jesus is saying salvation is from the Jews. It is not for the Jews, at least not for them only, and not for them specially. That is to say they were chosen to deliver the message that leads to salvation. But delivering the message of salvation is not itself salvation. So yes, there is, there is great honor in that. I mean, let, me, let me illustrate this personal, I mean individually. Remember John the Baptist? I think John the Baptist actually personifies what uh, Paul is talking about here, personifies in a person what, John, what Paul is talking about here with regards to the whole Jewish uh, race, or not race, but group of people. John the Baptist, he's the one who, when he saw Jesus, what did he say? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the same John who baptized Jesus, who heard the voice of God descending and saw this, the dove of the Spirit descending on him like a dove, the voice of God saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. This is the same John who said of Jesus, I'm not worthy to untie his sandals, but who sent, when he was in prison, sent his disciples, John's disciples, to Jesus to ask, are you the one who is to come, or shall we wait for another? Jesus answered his question, answered the question to his disciples, and then he turned to the crowd and he said this, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears, let him hear. In other words, John was uniquely privileged to pave the way for the coming of the Messiah. And he actually witnessed the Messiah come. But paving the way, proclaiming the message of the coming of the kingdom, no matter how privileged it is, pales in comparison to actually being in the kingdom and actually embracing the king Especially when, if, if when he comes, she says, are you the one who is to come, or shall we wait for another? But, you know, while I use John the Baptist as an example for, to, make a, to illustrate a point here about what Paul is teaching in verses 1 and 2 uh, of, of chapter 3, it's, all, it's unfair, really, to use John the Baptist in one way to lead into to Paul's next truth, which is, no one is righteous, not not one, whether you're Jew or Gentile, because the Jews are no better off than the Gentiles, and the Gentiles are no better off than the Jews. As Paul then, he reels off a, 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 a stinging indictment. We've just, we've just read that. This is no one is righteous, no not one, and he goes through that whole list. But now, if y'all noticed when I was reading through that list, Paul puts those uh, indictments in the third person. They talks about they. <coughs> But I think really to understand what Paul is saying here, although he's writing to a group of believers, I think it's really, we should put it in the first person to really feel the immediacy of what Paul is saying. This is the same Paul, who, by the way, who a few chapters later is going to say of himself, O wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? So I want to, us to take a look at this indictment that Paul gives the whole human race, and put it in the first person. <laughs> no, one is, no one is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. 
Together, they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Our throat is an open grave. We use our tongues to deceive. The venom of asp is under our lips. Our mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Our feet are swift to shed blood. In our paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace we have not known. There is no fear before God in our eyes. There is no fear of God before our eyes. It, it has a different ring to it when you put it in the first person, doesn't it? Now, I know some of you may be thinking, maybe all of you may be thinking, you think, wait a minute, I know I'm not perfect. I know I'm not perfect. I mean, I know I cut people off in traffic once in a while, and I may from time to time, on a bad day, say a mean thing or two about my neighbor, but come on, this list you've just read, venom of asp under our lips and all that stuff, and this list can't be about me. Well, consider what the prophet Isaiah says in chapter 64, verse 6. He says, we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteous deeds, all our righteous deeds, are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. That's a King James Version. I usually use the ESV, but for that verse, King James Version has more of a ring to it. Filthy rags. Our righteous deeds are filthy rags, apart from Christ. So Paul puts it this way as he closes this, this uh, section. He says, now we all know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Verses 19 and 20 really summarize this whole section, bring it, brings it to a conclusion that started at chapter 1, verse 18. It concludes here that those that... We know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. And wait a minute. The law and the whole world held account the whole the law and the whole world held accountable to God. I'm, wait a minute. The Gentiles didn't have the law, did they? They weren't given the law. So how can the law condemn the Gentiles? I think the answer really is pretty simple. The Jews had every advantage. They, had a, they, had, they were in covenant relationship with God. They were given, if you, you may recall in, in uh, Exodus, God himself spoke originally. He came down the mountain and spoke directly to them and gave them the Ten Commandments. And then he gave it to them on stone. I mean, they had every advantage. They had a covenantal relationship with God, and they had the law. What Paul is saying here is, look, if the Jews who had every advantage couldn't keep the law, the Gentiles don't have a chance. So, for the last two chapters then, building up to what we've just read, Paul has been taking us on a journey. He's been taking us on a journey that brings us to a unique place. And when I say us, I mean all of humanity. All of humanity that had lived up to that time and would live from to, through the end of time, to the second coming. He's taking them to, the, to a unique place. He's taking them to the foot of the cross. And what happened at the cross? And why did it have to happen? Well, we know Christ died there, but why did he have to die? Because God is both faithful and righteous. What did God promise? Even in, the, even in Genesis, in chapter 3, verse 15, basically, I'm going to redeem my people. It started there. At the fall, God promised, and he, he reiterated those promises over and over again, I am going to redeem my people. But we also know that God is righteous. And the penalty for sin is what? Death. It's death. So God's re promise to redeem and God's righteous requirement that sin be punished, they had, both of those things had to happen. So at the cross, God's righteousness and God's promise of redemption met in the death of Jesus Christ. Paul put it this way. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. 
for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we are justified and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption of Jesus, through the redemption of Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You could have 10 sermons on those verses alone. You'll know, you'll be happy to know I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to give you is the short version. It, it doesn't cover everything, but I think it's a pretty good summary of what Paul is saying here. You'll find it in 2 Corinthians at uh, chapter 5, verse 21. What Paul is saying here about what Jesus... I said, we've come, to a, we've come on a journey. We, where did we come? We came to the foot of the cross. What happened there? And why did it have to happen? We find the answer in chapter 2 of Corinthians, I mean, 2 Corinthians at chapter 5, verse 21. For our sake, he, meaning God the Father, made him, meaning Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him, that is in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. Let me say that again. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. How bad are your sins? How bad are my sins? Let me put it to you this way. If after Adam and Eve, only two people had lived, me and Jesus Christ, or one of you and Jesus Christ, Jesus, in order for me to be redeemed, or for you to be redeemed, Jesus would still have to go to the cross. So how bad are my sins? How bad are your sins bad enough for Jesus to go to the cross and die for them? There's no other way to understand the gospel. Now Paul has been teaching. What Paul is teaching here in chapter 3 of Romans, he teaches in many other places. The law condemns, but it cannot save. Only faith in Christ and his redeeming work can save us. So, with that being true, you would think Paul would end this letter, or not the letter, but would end chapter 3 of Romans by saying, by putting the law out to pasture. I mean, it's done its work, it's over, it's all good. That's, you know, you put the old gray mare out to pasture, right? That law did, did a great job, plowed those fields, all that good stuff. But Paul surprises us. That's not where he goes with this at verse 27 through the end of the chapter. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? Here's his answer. By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. I think sometimes it's good to get uh, trans other translations to compare. Let's take a look at the New, New Living paraphrase. This, the ESV is a literal translation. Translation, in other words, it takes the Greek and tries to render it as close as it can to what was meant in the Greek. It doesn't. It doesn't paraphrase it. The New Living paraphrase puts this uh, verse 31 this way. Well, then, if we emphasize faith, does this mean that we can forget about the law? Of course not. In fact, only when we have faith do we truly fulfill the law. And this is how the living Bible paraphrase puts it. Well then, if we are saved by faith, does this mean that we are no longer that we no longer need obey God's laws? Just the opposite. In fact, only when we trust Jesus can we truly obey him. Thomas Schreiner says this in his uh, commentary on Romans. This is how he treats uh, verse 31, and I found this helpful, and I hope you might find it helpful. This is what uh, Schreiner said. The moral norms of the law still function as the authoritative will of, the God, of God for the believer. 
The idea is not precisely that the law is fulfilled by faith in Christ, but rather that those who have faith in Christ will keep the law. In other words, for those who are in Christ, the law no longer condemns, but it does continue to instruct. And I would, let th I would like for that to be our application, our word of application for today. The law can never save us, as, as we've said, and that's what Paul is saying here. Only faith in Christ can do that. But we should never take or use our, our salvation, if you will, our status as saved people, to keep on sinning so that grace may abound, as the Apostle Paul says in another place. He would say, God forbid that that be true. What we are called upon as Christians to do is to make partnership with the triune God who lives within us. Knowing that we, and, and, and then obeying Christ out of faith, obeying, obeying the law of the Spirit out of faith, knowing that these two truths are, are, are established. Our salvation lies in what Christ has done for us. It's already a done deal. It's over. You can think about it this way. Isn't it wonderful to know that there's, if you're in Christ, there is nothing you can do to make him love you more or make him love you less. We can rest in knowing that we are saved in what Christ has already done for us, and we can rest and work with the Spirit in partnership with the Spirit for our sanctification because knowing that, that he has continues to work in us to achieve that sanctification. We are not yet, we're, we're, we're perfect as purposes of salvation, but sanctification is an ongoing process, and the Spirit who has saved us continues to work in us for our, for our good and for God's glory. Let us pray. Dear Father, you are a good and gracious God that you have, that you have called us to yourself. Those who are in Christ, we are new creations, and you have made it so. There's nothing we could do, ever do, for you make you love us less or love us more. And that is a wonderful, wonderful thing to know. We are adopted into your family.